kids and the youth workers. So, <laughs> all right. Well, welcome this morning. Um, it's, it's just good to see everybody's face again, just to be able to get together. So let's open in prayer and uh, come before the Lord. Lord, thank you so much for another week. Thank you uh, um, just for, I know we don't always feel it, but for fresh clean air, Lord, um, cold air sometimes, though it may be. We thank you for uh, all the snow that that does fall and keeps our grass green in the spring and our wells full for those who have wells around here. And Lord, there are blessings, even in things that sometimes we can find inconvenient. So we thank you. We want to praise you for all you're doing in our lives. We praise you for the work that you're doing. We praise you for the work that you give us to do. And Lord, today, may we just worship you in spirit and truth, beginning um, with one heart, Lord. One heart is one body before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Our hymn this morning is number eight, Praise the Lord Almighty. Why don't we stand as we sing all four verses this morning. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Shelters thee under his wings, safe so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how all thy longings have been granted in what he ordaineth? Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriend thee. Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the Amen sound from his people again. Gladly for a we adore him. Amen, and you may be seated. Oh, that's a great hymn. It is one of my favorites. I, I love the line there at the end. Let the amen sound from his people again. And... As many of us know here, that word amen means so be it. And that is that line just talking about his people coming in agreement with his work. Whatever it is to be in agreement with what he's doing. All right, um, announcements. April 3rd, we will be having another food giveaway. So um, again, last time was just great. Uh, we're, we're excited to see what the Lord is going to do with this as an opportunity to outreach to our community, interact with our community. Um, so if you would like to make donations of food, um, perishables, canned goods, um, uh, monetary donations, see either, well probably Carol, you're the best person to see, Carol Nardozzi 
If you're interested in helping out on the day, whether it's handing out food or helping out with the things in the parking lot, we, we also hand out gospel tracts, pray with people and such. You can see Carol or John Adler as well. Um, so it's really exciting, something we're hoping to be doing pretty regularly. Um, also, Pastor Scott has laid out items from the lost and found in the kitchen on the counter. This is not one of the announcements where it's whoever wants it, come take it. It is please check to see if it is yours. Uh, so there are some things um, that have been sitting around for a while in the lost and found. I think most of the school you said has gone through the stuff, so that's very likely it might be from the church. Uh, maybe one of your kids left something. So please head back there and check that out. All right, uh, any other announcements? I think we are good then. All right, our reading today is going to be from Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 through 24. Oh, before we forget, one announcement. This is one I should have remembered. This Wednesday night, we will begin handing out famine packets to the youth group. So those who have been around for that, you can know to expect the youth in the church to start coming to ask you for money. Uh, we are going to be raising money this year to help support our local pregnancy care centers. Um, the plan is going to be to divide whatever we raise between the two, the one in Geneva and the one in Newark, to help both in our community. So uh, that should start happening within the next week, so don't be surprised. All right, Exodus 18, 13 through 24. And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood before Moses with the, from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? And all the people stand before you morning until evening. And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out, for this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice, and I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people, so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them statutes and laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness that place over them to place over them and be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all the people will be able to go to their place in peace. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Well, Lord... We thank you for the wisdom you show, Lord, that you share with us so freely, that you don't expect us to just figure things out by ourselves, carry burdens alone, Lord, but you provide wisdom and help, Lord. And above all, the help that you give us as your church is the Holy Spirit, and what a gift that is, Lord. Aside from our salvation, perhaps there is no greater gift that you have given us to walk on this earth with your Holy Spirit in us. So, Lord, through the Spirit today, may we praise you, may we honor you, and may we glorify you in all we say, all we do, all that we present to you from our financial gifts to the gifts of our songs, to the voices, to our love for one another and our obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
sing this blessing together. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And amen. 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 And I this morning, Lord, that you would be in this place, Lord, that you would bless us this morning as we hear from you, as we fellowship together, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of your church and the body of Christ that you've given us right here. Lord, we thank you for the love that you show us. Thank you for this time together. We give you this time in your name.
passion for your holy name. You are 
our prayer this morning, Lord, that you would pour out all the old wine, Lord. Fill us with new wine this morning, Lord. Allow us to be vessels ready to be filled by your spirit, by your word this morning, Lord. Allow us to be uh, willing, Father, to yield to you, willing to burn for you, Lord of, uh, Lord, you've given us your spirit, you've light, you've given us the spark for the fire, Lord, but uh, we have to be willing to burn for you, Lord, we have to be, allow your spirit to do that for us this morning, so Father, we, we come to you and, and ask that, Lord, that you would prepare every heart in this place, Lord, to hear from you, to hear from your spirit this morning, that we might leave this place different than we came in this morning might 
leave and be the light that you call us to be, be more like your son when we exit these doors, Lord. So we, we ask that. We know you can do that, Lord, if we allow you. Help us, Lord. We give you this time in your name. Amen. Amen. Don't leave, please, because we just have special package after special package after special package. Where are they coming from, man? The, out, this, is, this is the COVID generation, let me tell you. <laughs> this is Leo Christopher Cartazolo, and this is Frank and Lauren Cartazolo's latest January 6th, Wednesday at 1023 in the morning. That's a good time to have a baby. And seven, uh, eight pounds, 11 ounces. And now she's the only honest one. She says, I think about 22 inches. I can accept that. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come to me. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come unto me. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come to me. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come unto me. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come to me. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come unto me. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. And now you may be dismissed for junior church if that's where you're going. And the rest of us can take out our Bibles and let's open up to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Put another finger. Well, you don't have to because it's the next book. Titus. Well, the next book after the next book. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you. You look great, man. And uh, that's Titus chapter 1. But you'll be right there, just about. Um, you know, Nick pointed out, Pastor Nick, pointed out the hymn today. He read that last verse and let the amen. And he says, oh my goodness, listen to the first song here. <laughs> Talking about the amen and, and how the Holy Spirit weaves things together in spite of us. And I want you to direct your attention to verse 2. Praise to the Lord who over all things so wondrously reigneth, shelters thee under his wings, yes, so gently sustaineth. Doesn't he? He so gently sustains us. Hast thou not seen how all thy longings have been granted in what he ordaineth? Because he has ordained everything that we see in this universe. He has 
ordained us before the foundation of the world. That's another word for he saved us before the foundation. He ordained that we would be his child before the foundation of the wor world. Uh, something that's not possible to completely understand. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to read the first 13 verses. My purpose this morning is not to exegete, that is to teach line by line each little aspect. My purpose is to bring some clarification to what we did last week when we were in Acts chapter 6 and when we introduced the candidates that we were asking for your prayer um, for the families and the candidates that we want to bring uh, uh, an elder and five uh, deacons officially on the board, and I'll talk more about that later. But I wanted to bring some clarification because we had some excellent questions, and I have to confess some good criticisms. Uh, you know, um, I think we've shared this before. The leadership of the church isn't perfect. Oh, not perfect. But ought to be blameless. There's a difference, right? Um, not sinless perfection, but blameless so that when an accusation comes, it would not stick. That that individual that's in leadership in the body of Christ, in the church of Jesus Christ, happens to be, we happen to be here at Seneca Falls. There was one in Corinth. There was one in Galatia. There's one in Geneva. There, there's several in the communities around us. We're not unique in any sense that we have a corner on the market. Calvary Chapel doesn't have a corner on the market. We're just a drop in the bucket, as the scriptures would say. Not an insignificant drop. Because there's no child of God that is insignificant to him. But in behalf of all the other guys that are on the leadership with me, we want to apologize if there was any confusion because we probably, as we look back, didn't properly prepare the congregation for what we were going to do that day. It doesn't change much except that we want to ask your forgiveness for not thinking more clearly through the process of how we would bring a new elder and you know five deacons onto the uh, leadership team uh, of Calvary Chapel, Seneca Falls. And that's a legitimate question and concern, and we want you to know that we do everything that we can to not have that kind of miscommunication take place. But once again, we're, we can't cover and know everything um, because we're not God. <laughs> and aren't you glad? And uh, you're not either, by the way, just in case <laughs> anyone has any ideas. Um, but let's, let's look at this. And we're going to be looking at a couple of things, and hopefully it will help to clarify. I want to make this caveat before I start. Is that the right word, Scott? Um, I want to say, he's my uh, dictionary, um, and I just want to say that anyone in this fellowship, whether you're a brand new visitor or you've been here for 20 years, has every, not only right, but we have an expectation and a desire that anyone who has questions about anything in the leadership come to the leadership and directly ask them. Uh, there is a tendency, because we're human beings, to have an attitude like this. Oh, you know how they are. <laughs> that, that's simply not acceptable. We understand, and we've all done that, but we have to be very careful. Well, you know how they are. You know, you tell them and they never listen. Well, I want you to know this before I start. We listen very carefully to you. In fact, the reason we have such a blessed and loving congregation is not because of the five of us. It's because of you. And I mentioned this last week. Not only are you willing to hear the word of God, many congregations will not put up with that from the pastors. And um, we believe that this is a great church because of you, a church that truly loves one another. 
We talk about that a lot. Sounds like a broken record, but it's the most important aspect. I believe I, the first words I said last week was, and the greatest of these is love. If we have not love, what are we? A sounding, what do you call it? A sounding what? Gong. Thank you, gong. I was thinking of the gong show earlier, but uh, that's not really how I wanted it to come out. <laughs> Some of you are laughing. You're old enough to remember that. <laughs> the kids are going, the gong show, you know. Is that a new, is that a new uh, uh, iOS, uh, you know, cell phone? <laughs> Verse 1 in chapter 3. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence, respect. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, someone brand new, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, in other words, in the same way, the same manner, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for, for themselves a good report, a good standing or reputation, and great boldness. You might want to underline that. And great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, if we ever needed to pray before a message, it's a message on church leadership. Your church is so far-reaching and so expansive around the globe. And your bride, your church, is precious in your sight. Lord, we're waiting and longing for the appearing of our heavenly bridegroom and we see that you're on the horizon closer and closer. In fact, this generation in the church is closer than any other generation that ever was in the church to the rapture. You're coming to steal us away on that wedding night. Father, we need wisdom. We need the Holy Spirit to gain understanding of how it is that you want us to see in your word leadership should take place. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to start by saying there isn't one church in the entire world that's truly a church of Jesus Christ, truly the bride of Christ, that has it Correct, 100%. It's my personal belief 
that every single pastor, every single congregant, every single Christian is going to get to heaven and there's going to be one great big, oh, now I see. We are all, in some point, going to be in error about something with regard to the Scriptures. If you aren't, we need to see you immediately so that you can help straighten us all out. That's just the nature of a human being. We aren't perfect. We would be God. And so we need to be not just loving, but understanding with each other. And it's my hope that as we look at the Scriptures today, we'll have a better understanding of how to look at that and then maybe even how to proceed and make that happen. You know, there's warfare. There's a battle. There's a spiritual battle, a big one. The biggest one that ever was in the universe, and it happens to be invisible. <laughs> That's why Paul writes things like, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the dark rulers of this dark and evil world. And the enemy has missionaries out there just like we do in the church. Uh, the enemy's out to make converts. And the enemy has missionaries in our culture and in the cultures around the world. And they're seeking to convert our young people, a generation, a nation, to their own belief system. It's interesting the way that Paul speaks of godliness in Timothy. You won't find the word in the New Testament until you get to 1 Timothy, where you have this word used eight times by the Apostle Paul. And no doubt Paul is exhorting this young man, Timothy, to godliness, to godlikeness. By the way, Justin think. Just in case you're thinking, that lets me off the hook. It doesn't. Later when we get to Titus, we're going to see that the same exact requirements that are here for church leadership, just a cursory reading of the New Testament epistles and the Gospels shows us that every believer is called by God to live that separate or separated, should I say, life unto him and from the world. It's not something that God says, you know, you leaders better get this right, but the rest of you guys, you know, you're just the peasants. Don't worry about it. No, he's very serious. God is very serious about his instruction for how we should walk as his children. And I have found, as I look through the Scriptures, my goodness, everyone is supposed to have the characteristics and the qualities that are mentioned in these pastoral letters. Because when you look at the other epistles and you, when you hear the teaching of Jesus and His words, you will find that this is the expectation God has for all of His kids. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, This is a sure foundation. The foundation of God is sure that anyone and everyone who names the name of Christ shall depart from iniquity. Iniquity. The twistedness in our nature that we inherited from Adam. Everyone is on the same level playing field, whether you're a leader, a pastor, or you just got saved yesterday, or maybe today, wouldn't that be wonderful? You see, verse 1 says, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desire, in the King James, he desireth a good work. You know, you read that and you go, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> I, I mentioned last week, Pastor Chuck, the founder of Calvary Chapel, he says, when people came to me and says, I want to be a pastor, he would say to them, 
will do everything you possibly can to get out of it. And then if after praying and asking the Lord, you still feel that this is a calling, an anointing from God, and you have the same heart of the Apostle Paul when he says, woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel, then you got to do what God says. It's not to be entered lightly, obviously, is what Chuck was teaching. This desire is not an unhealthy ambition. And the Bible speaks of unhealthy ambitions. Very dangerous. It actually speaks of a willingness to be shapen by God. It actually means, that first word desire means to be shapen by God. By God. It means to stretch ahead or stretch forward. It's a process. It's not something that is instantaneous. When a person first gets saved, gets saved, they're usually not saved as a pastor that day. In fact, if, if someone had told me I was going to be a pastor the day I got saved, I'd say, well, maybe we'll do, maybe we'll do this some other time. <laughs> that would have frightened me beyond belief. It's a process. It's the idea of a young man leaning in the direction of godliness. I'd love to serve the Lord. I'd love to do this. I'd love to give my life to the ministry. I'd love to be involved in caring for your people, Lord, for your sheep. It's where we get the word origami in English. You know, where's Hank? Where you, you fold the papers and you make little animals and stuff to be yielded to the Spirit of God to the point where he can mold me and bend me and shape me in whatever direction he wants. The second word desireth is, hey, it's a good thing to desire leadership. There's not only nothing wrong with it, the church needs leadership. The church needs guidance. So it's very important to have leadership. Now, it's the office of a bishop. Now, here's where we get in trouble. See, my growing up in the Episcopal Church, when the bishops had the miter hats on and all the vestments and my father wore, I used to love that because we would go to church with dad and we'd walk in the snow when we had a snow day and we took turns. I had three brothers. We got to go with dad. Early in the morning, we'd walk to church because you couldn't get the car out of the driveway. And we'd get there and we got to help him put the robes on. Man, some of those robes were neat. I mean, the ones around Christmas, white and blue and beautiful colors, speaking of heaven and all this stuff. I mean, it was exciting. I wasn't saved. Uh, I didn't know there was any connection to all those things. But I found out later after I got saved, the whole Old Testament and the priestly system, it's where they got it from. It, it didn't just appear out of nothing. And I remember walking down there thinking, oh, this is great. Wow, maybe my father someday will be a bishop and he can have that beautiful staff and maybe one of those neat hats. They're kind of weird, but, you know, if you're a bishop, it's not. You see him on TV, you go, and what do people do when they see those hats and they see those robes? They go, ooh. And there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But if I can't see God and say, ooh, whoa, see God does not want anything, including church leaders, to interfere with what he's trying to do with a young man or young woman's heart. The office of a bishop. Well, when you start reading the Bible, it's not so strange. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness. That's interesting, Peter of the sufferings of Christ. That's even more interesting. And also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock. Peter, feed my sheep. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. Another word. Not by compulsion, but by willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, in another place he is called 
the bishop of your soul. And the reason I point this out is when people see bishop, they go, oh, no, I grew up in a church like that. I don't want anything to do with bishop. Well, then you'll have to argue with God a little because he uses four different terms, bishop, overseer, elder, and pastor. And they are, for the most part, in the Bible, in the New Testament, they are, for the most part, referring to the position of a pastor over a flock. And by the way, all kinds of churches do this in different manner, and there's nothing sinful necessarily about that. We have different ways of expressing our faith. We have different ideas of what church is supposed to look. You know, Nate and I were talking yesterday about we don't, we don't know exactly what the church looked like and how it was all configured. We've got ideas. We read good material from theologians and historians and people who have done archaeology and so forth. But we don't know exactly. And so it's not surprising that different churches do things different ways. Lightfoot, who was a theologian in the 1800s in Durham, England, he said that by the end of the first century, that's less than 70 years since Christ died, rose from the dead, and ascended back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit. 70 years, he says. And by that time, by the end of the first century, the church already had three forms of government. Episcopos, um, Presbyterus, where, it's where those names come from, uh, the churches we see today, the mainline denominations, and Congregational. And those were the guys that were right there listening to Jesus. Those were the guys that were there writing the book of Acts. <laughs> and they couldn't get it right. I had heard one pastor say, it's a good thing, it confused the enemy. Satan doesn't have a clue what we're doing because we don't have a clue what we're doing. It's not all bad. I don't want him hanging around here, do you? And so we got to be careful when we are so, including us, and maybe especially us as leaders, when we become so dogmatic. And we need to be open in our hearts mainly to other points of view. We hope in this church that you will give us that same deference to try to interpret what we see in the scriptures. I can say this about the leadership in your church here, if this is, if this is your church. We're not perfect, sinless, but we are blameless in this sense. I do not know of one person in the leadership of this church that ever, has ever once maliciously done something to go, you know, we won't tell them this, but we'll just kind of sneak this under and we'll get this in. I don't know of any. It may have happened, but I don't know of any. And I've been here for since 1985. I just look young. Okay. And because now that I'm 40, I'm struggling a little bit. I had one person in the congregation come up to me. You got to stop telling people you're 40. You're, you're lying. I said, honey. I went low enough to make sure everyone got the point. <laughs> and everyone laughs when I say it, so some of them get it. <laughs> the episkopos is the overseer. It's used to describe the function, the work that is seeing over or watching over a local fellowship. Okay? The word Elder speaks of the dignity or the maturity of one who is in the role of that oversight. So, you know, same person, but different roles that you play. Kind of like the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm a father. I'm a son. I have a father. He's in heaven now. But I have a son. I have a father. And I'm a husband. And not one of those three roles 
is even similar. <laughs> but it's still, it's still me. And so when we look at this in the leadership, the, the, the New Testament tends to use these four terms interchangeably. Overseer, elder, pastor, and bishop. Now, there's different opinions. Some guys think, and we were talking about this yesterday too, some guys believe that every pastor is an elder, and I think everyone believes that. But others believe that not every elder is a pastor, a teaching pastor. And you can argue with that. Listen, you can read books for the rest of your life on that, and you could lose your mind. Or you could choose what you think fits how you look at it, and then read your Bible and get on with your evangelism, get on with your, 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 your struggles and your personal life and try to be cooperative with the Holy Spirit and be yielded to the Holy Spirit so he can continue to do what he said he would do and that's conform us into the image of his, his son, Jesus Christ. The first purpose that we're here is to glorify God. The second is that he might be able to conform us into the image of his son. So we have these terms, bishop, pastor, elder, overseer. In Ephesians chapter 4, we have the offices that are given. This is the gifts that are given to the body of Christ. And I'll just read very quickly to you from Ephesians chapter 4. These gifts are given by none other than Jesus Christ, our Savior, to the church. And he, Jesus himself, gave some, gave, it's a gift, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. You say, but Ray, it says pastors and teachers. Yes, it does. But there's a Granville Sharps rule that says when two personal nouns are connected by a conjunction, it's one and the same. There's a fourfold ministry, so to speak. Okay? So you have apostles, you have prophets, you have pastors, pastor teachers, and you have evangelists. And I'm not going to get into that explanation here. There's no time for that. The Bible is a big book with a lot of things in it. And I don't know about you, I've been a pastor now since 1994. They ordained me here when this was a, a, a Baptist church. And I still am amazed at how little I know. <laughs> People go, oh, pastor, you know so much. I struggle because I, I know next to nothing. In fact, the further I go, you might want to get rid of me. The further I go in my ministry, the more I realize, the less I know. I thought it would work the other way around. I thought after 25 years, I go, finally have it down. And then I meet Paul the Apostle. And he goes, I'm the chief sinner of everyone in the whole body of Christ. Well, wait a minute, Paul. Can we talk about this? You know, I, I think I'm a candidate. You know, I, I think I outweigh you in this area of being this chief sinner. And so it says he desires a good work at the end of verse 3. Wow, I want to be a leader. I want to be a pastor. Do you know what a good work is in the Greek, which is what, not the geek, in the Greek, what the Bible's written in here? It means this. A good work means an excellent difficulty. <laughs> oh, pick me, pick me. I want an excellent difficulty. I got enough trouble in my life. <laughs> I don't need an excellent difficulty. That's what it is. You can't change the meaning of it. That's what the meaning is. It's, an, it's not easy. Now, I'm not complaining. I believe my calling and election is sure. Uh, well, most of the time, <laughs> except for when I'm talking to my wife. Honey, am I going to get to the, the, the judgment seat of Christ? He's going to go. Really, Ray? You thought you were a pastor? I mean, give me a break. And the angels, Gabriel's about going to be up there going, give it to him, Jesus. He thinks he's a pastor. I, I agree with you, Jesus. I don't think he's a pastor either. 
Anybody else struggle with things like that? And you see, when he says it's an excellent difficulty, we're talking here about God's calling, God's anointing, God's gifting. Let me tell you something. If you don't understand the calling that's involved for coming into church leadership, then don't even get started. There's got to be a call. This isn't about some, and by the way, this is a problem in many churches. It's not a popularity contest. I, I can't tell you how many times I've come to Nick and Scott and said, you guys ought to be the pastor. You're better teachers. And they go, no, no, we don't have that call. You, you were called to be the pastor. <laughs> we know you're not a good teacher too, but the fact is that um, we can love each other and be honest about everything. Why? Because the greatest of these things is love. <laughs> I remember we went to an all-black church down in North Carolina for a while, longer than my family wanted to go. And we would come into the church, and man, they'd be hopping and humming, and boy, when they, when they took an offering, they'd dance down the aisles, and there was drums and lots of loud music. I loved it. I was in my glory. I said, honey, they love us. She goes, not everybody. I said, no, look around. They all love us. She goes, they don't all love us. I said, well, honey, I don't you open your eyes. Look at this thing. Every time we come, everybody loves us. No, not everybody loves us. All right, whatever. I, I guess I was blind to that. But I remember the guy got up and he preached from John 3, 16. And he goes, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all that believe in him should not perish. And then he said, this is how you can tell you're a Christian, that you love one another. He took another text, I think John 13, 34 and 35. This is how they'll know you're my disciples, by the love you have. And people, he says, the pastor goes, you've been coming to me saying, pastor, you've been preaching on this for four weeks. When are you going to move on to another subject? He says, when we begin to love one another. I thought, wow, that's not bad preaching. This, of course, this calling, this gifting, this anointing does not mean that the only good work is to be a bishop, pastor, or elder. If you're a carpenter, that's a good work. God doesn't make any distinction in terms of the quality of a life. You should be the best carpenter that you can be for Jesus. If you're a school teacher, you should be the best school teacher. If you're a plumber, if you're a garbage man, if you're a janitor, you should, if you're an electrician, you should be the best and do everything as unto the Lord. Occasionally, my own children got the idea when they were younger, of course, not now, that they had to behave better than everyone else in the church because I was the pastor. We went through that phase, you know. But I had to explain to them that that's not true. When I was a school teacher, after I got saved, I was still a school teacher for five years before I became a pastor, our household was going to be run according to God's word. As far as my kids were concerned, my being a pastor had nothing to do with my expectations for their behavior. As for me and my house, we were going to serve the Lord. Now look. I've known some pastors that have destroyed their children by expecting them not to be kids, by expecting them to be perfect little angels. That just doesn't happen. They're children. So we move through this, and we're going to move through it very quickly because I want to make another point. A bishop then must be blameless. We already talked about that. The husband of one wife, it actually means a one wife man. That's a whole message. I think divorce has been a plague in our culture. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Maybe even not unbelievers. Temperate, you know, moderate. But this word temperate means wineless. Not mm, that kind of whining, but the wine you drink less. 
temperate, sober-minded, serious, of good behavior. Do we need to explain that? If you knew, you need to read the New Testament in the epistles. It tells you all about what good behavior should be. Look at me. And it's impossible. <laughs> what do you mean, Ray? There are just some times I don't behave. And you're the pastor. I'm a sinner. Sinner saved by grace, Jay knows. Good behavior. Well, how can I do it? With God, all things are possible. Hospitable. Able to teach. Not given to wine. Not violent. Not greedy for money. But gentle. I mean, all those are pretty obvious, right? Able to teach. Not given to wine. Not violent. Not greedy for money. But gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not covetousness. Not ornery. I, I wrote this down. Temperate. The root word, like I said, is wineless. Self-controlled. Sober is self-controlled. Not quarrelsome. Here it is. I've got to have my own way. I have to be right. It means not to be contentious. Listen to this. Causing an argument or likely to be a person who causes an argument. Very controversial. In or for the sake of being controversial. You ever meet someone like that? They're just controversial because they kind of like the way it gets people going and all roused up. Josh, you were like that for a long time when you were younger. You've, you've grown up now. But, you know, just I'm going to say something that's going to shock them. You ever meet people like that? <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, you know, I was a PK, a priest kid. And the kids would, you know, just so they wouldn't make fun of me, I would say a couple of bad words sometime so they can say, I'm a regular guy. Don't be pinning that label on me. I can do rotten stuff too. We don't want that attitude at all, do we? Not quarrelsome, not covetous. The root word and the meaning of that in the language is not loving money or being greedy. It doesn't say not having money. I know a lot of Christians have a lot of money. And God can entrust it to them because they are able to take that money and use it for whatever God's purposes are for their life. Reverence. To regard or treat with great respect, with dignity, with sanctity. Grave means not the kind you dig when you die. Grave means serious, honorable, sober. I think this is a two-parter. <laughs> I apologize. Well, maybe I don't apologize. I think it's important for us to see these things. All right, let's do this. Let's go to Titus. Two pages to your right in my Bible. No, no, more like five. I forgot about 2 Timothy. I want to show you a point. I want to make a really, what I think is the most important point of what I'm trying to communicate. I want to show that to you in the second chapter of Titus. But very quickly, take a look at chapter 1, starting in verse 5. I don't know what you have for your subheading. Mine says qualified elders. Verse 5 says, for this reason, this is Paul writing, Paul writing to Titus, chapter 1. Titus, verse 3, for this reason I left you in Crete, that little island in south of Greece, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint, he doesn't say to elect, he says appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So there needed to be an elder in each city where there was a church, I'm assuming. We don't know for sure. It's what it seems to be indicating. If a man is blameless, look at these qualifications again, the husband of one wife, 
having faithful children, not accused of dissipation. Um, dissipation is debauchery. <laughs> Wicked living. Or insubordination, not being yielded, first and foremost, to the Holy Spirit. For a bishop, there's that term again, must be blameless, not perfect or sinless, as a steward of God, not self-willed, well, there's a big one, not quick-tempered, very important, can't be out of control, angry, not given to wine, there it is again, not violent, not greedy for money, hospitable, that's important, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. Wow, and then holding fast to the Word of God. Holding fast. The faithful Word, our lifeline, as He has been taught, that He may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Now he goes on to talk about the task of the elder. I'm not, I'll I maybe touch on that next week. The shepherd not only feeds the sheep, he has to protect the, the sheep. Because there's a lot of bad guys that Satan has roaming around trying to destroy. And listen carefully, look at me. Trying to divide the body. Maybe one sin that God hates more than anything else is someone who tries to divide the body. It's crucial and it can be fatal. And it's tragic. And it should never happen in God's church. But look at chapter 2. Now, these are the qualifications for a sound church. Guess what makes up a church? Not buildings, right? People. Us. We are the church. <laughs> we sing it, right? Guess what? You're the church. The leaders and pastors aren't the church. We're all t together, collectively, the church. But now this is going to talk about, well then, if that's the qualification for elders, what's the qualification for me, pastor? Try this on for size. But as for you, speak the things. Now this is Paul speaking to Titus. As for you, Titus, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Reference 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, because it says in the last days, the church, so-called, will not put up with sound doctrine. They don't want the Word of God. They want to be entertained. We need smoke machines and loud music. I'm not against smoke machines or loud music in and of themselves, but it can become a problem when that becomes the focus and not the element of worship that encourages me to be more like Him and to be closer to God. That the older men be sober, reverent. Do you recognize any of these things? Sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and patience. My goodness, it's almost like there's more requirement for the average guy than there is for the leader. <laughs> or at least equally as much. That was redundant, wasn't it? Um, in love, in patience. You mean if I'm not on the board, I've got to be patient too? Uh-huh. That's right. Well, why be a leader? It's a hard job. It's, a, it's an excellent difficulty. Precisely. <laughs> it must be a call. It must be an anointing. And it can't be by men. It must be by God. And by God's grace, I have been called. Not because I think so, but it's only by God's grace. And the confirmation comes from where? The brethren. And if it doesn't come, and by the way, every shepherd in the entire world has a flock. They have sheep. Sometimes people say, well, I, I think I'm a leader. 
How do I know if I'm a leader? Well, look behind you. Is anyone there? <laughs> the sheep do what? They follow the shepherd. Now, don't follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Like Paul said, follow the chief shepherd. Follow the bishop of your soul. That's who we should follow. That's who I should follow. I want to follow him. You should want to follow him too. But only follow me as I follow Christ. Don't follow me when I'm messing up. But also, don't fire me because I mess up. Come and speak to me. Can you imagine if everyone that's a Christian had a friend that loved them enough to tell them when they saw something going a little south? Wouldn't that change the church? Right? Not coming, ranting, but just saying, hey, man, bro, I love you, and I wish I didn't even have to do this. God's making me come to you. I hate it. I love you. I want you to know I love you. No matter what I say, just remember I love you. <laughs> Can you remember that? Whenever you go and you reprove a person or rebuke an individual, which is sometimes necessary, please remember, go in love. And if you can't go in love, get someone else to go. Just please, just get somebody else to go. Because, and, and that's okay if you do that. Just make sure you don't go without love. The older women. Okay, let's see how the women do. Likewise, uh-oh, likewise. That's not good. What does likewise mean? Same way, same list. And now he's going to add to the women, the poor women, that they may be reverent in behavior. Well, that's the same. Not slanders. What does he say? Why does he say that about women and not men? I don't know. I didn't write it. Uh, not yeah, moving on. Not given to much wine. I guess the women can have a little wine. I don't understand that. I've never seen anything good come from alcohol in my whole life, including my own abuse of it. I've just never seen. If you want to be a leader here, we would say, don't have wine. Don't drink alcohol. How how can that help anybody? Right. How can it help you to hear from God better? I want everything in my life to make me hear from God better. Oh boy, Lord, thanks a lot. <sighs> I've got a quick caffeine. You need to pray for me. I'm addicted. I drink a half to one cup of caffeine every day, and I'm a mess. And I can't stop. I've told people, and I mean this, for me, personally, I said, getting off caffeine and booze before, you know, back before I got saved, getting off caffeine and booze is harder than getting off crack cocaine. I've never done crack cocaine, but I'm telling you what. <laughs> so how do you know, Ray? Because, because I know how I struggle. <laughs> But listen, don't be too proud of me. The only reason I didn't go do crack cocaine is I was afraid. <laughs> I was a chicken. And thank God I was a chicken. Amen? And so it says this. So I want you to hold me accountable. I can't believe I just said that. Not slanders, not given to much wine. Teachers of good things. And they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. That's where we get the idea of the Titus 2 woman. To be discreet, chaste, homemakers. Good. Doesn't mean you have to be only a homemaker. Doesn't mean, oh, you mean we can't have careers. Stop it. Obedient to their own husbands that the word of God may, be, may not be blasphemed. pretty powerful statement is Paul saying that I could be blaspheming the word of God who is Jesus if I'm participating and acting and doing this thing in this manner yeah oh my gosh that's the unpardonable sin I didn't say that and the Bible doesn't say that either what do we do when we sin, louder, when, when we sin. In other words, the moment I'm aware of my sin, we repent. 
we're going to have a little repentance time. <laughs> That's what this is all about. Oh, yes, it's the death of Jesus Christ. But he resurrected. He rose from the dead so that we could have life in him and that we could become more like him. And so if you're sitting there being convicted right now, oh, my gosh, I'll never make it. Join the club. Join the leaders, would you? Would you please join all of the new leaders and the old leaders and the leaders that are about to be? Would you please join us today in coming humbly before our Lord Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, forgive me. You fill in the blank for what you need to be forgiven for. It's none of my business. It's only the business of God and you and whomever you choose, and you should choose at least one or two. Your wife or your husband is a great place to start. Or your kids or your parents. Repent. I'm getting the car ahead of the horse, right? Uh, okay. The guys are going to come up and grab the elements, pass them out, and then when we're done receiving the elements, we'll partake together. The worship team is going to come up and lead us in adoration of our king. And if you have sin that you're dealing with, this is the time, folks. Empty it all right here. Leave it here. Leave it at the cross and plead with the Lord Jesus. He's already forgiven your sin. You just need to acknowledge it and ask him to heal you, and he will.
gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Sing that again. He shall return. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will about elders, we've talked a little bit about deacons, we've talked about the body of Christ, we've talked about what what does God want, what does God expect. The only one we haven't talked to this morning is the don't, those that don't know Jesus. I look around the room and I, I, I think as I look around, I, I don't see anyone who doesn't know Jesus, but I don't know your heart, only you know your heart, you only know whether you've made that decision to believe <laughs> it's not about understanding or I don't get in there's a lot of things I don't understand about the Bible people want to understand everything before they believe it doesn't work that way and it's a funny thing about communion if you don't know Jesus if you haven't asked him to be the Lord of your life this is meaningless it's empty. It's totally, you know, you, you know no, nothing bad happens to you. You can drink it, but it's, it's just some grape juice and what do you call these? Oyster cracker. With leaven in it, by the way. <laughs> We're a little off base here today, but that's okay. Uh, but you know what? If you don't know Jesus and you're not sure of where you stand, then you do that right now and Ask him. Invite him. Say, Lord, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that there's no hope for me for heaven unless I ask you to come into my heart and forgive me and be my Lord. Oh, when that happens, this becomes more than a reality. It, it becomes my life. And no matter what happens here, he keeps me forever, for eternity, in heaven. We've taught this before, and you know all about it if you've been here at all for any length of time. There's only two places that there's going to be after this present earth and heaven is burned up in the fire. God will consume it and allow it to dissipate and completely dissolve. He's going to recreate a new heaven and a new earth. And there's no other place to go but heaven or Gehenna, the burning lake of fire. And so that's a decision that God says, you have to make that choice. I won't force your hand. I won't make you be my bride. I won't hold a gun to your head. 
but for those of us that know him. What a joy to remember as often as we eat this bread and as often as we drink this cup. We remember, we celebrate the death of our precious Lord and Savior because it was his death that gave us life. Amen. Jesus on that day took the bread. He said, this is my body which was broken for you. Take this, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. Sometimes people say, well, it's just a ceremony. No, it's not. It's not just a ceremony. It's what I believe. It's what we know to be true. It's the blood, his own blood shed for us in the new covenant in his own blood. And he said, as often as you do this, as often as you drink this cup, do it, remembering my death and celebrating my resurrection in Jesus' name. Father, we're so thankful that we are able to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we give you our hearts to do with them what you will, Lord. You're a very personal God and loving God. You know us all the way down to the core. You know what we need before we need it. And we're asking you, as we close with this beautiful song, we're asking you, to change us and make us more into the image of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I need you, Jimmy. Let's all stand together. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find.
Father, we are so dependent on you. Um, so we pray, Lord, that as we go out into this world, that you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we would not rely on any uh, of our own uh, ambitions or strengths, but, Lord, we would just find our strength in you and in the power that comes uh, from your Holy Spirit, Lord. So go before us as we go home today and out into this world. And let us just be a salt and light uh, to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.